Uh, welcome everyone to the, the session on SGS in the public sphere. Uh, my name is John Dreisack and I'll be chairing this session. Um, I come from one of the beyonds in the subtitle of the conference, um, that of political science. Um, actually, I was talking to Sheila the other day and she, and who pointed out that uh, um, political science is one discipline which seems not to have been especially receptive to uh, clearly relevant work that has been done in STS. Um, by herself and by, by others. And I think, I think that's, probably, that's probably right. Um, in which case, political science is perhaps better located as, as the back of beyond rather than just beyond. Um, anyway, uh, of, of course, political science and STS um, do have common interests in the public sphere, which is the title of, uh, which is the, the, the topic of, of this session. Um, and also in uh, uh, those particular moments in the life of the public sphere, um, namely participatory and deliberative innovations um, in the context of uh, um, issues of scientific and te te technological risk. Um, although STS is, I think, much, good at, mu much better at, uh, at uh, um, explaining and investigating the meaning and significance of those innovations in its political science, which tends to just treat them as another form of uh, an another, another location for democratic innovation. Um, before I introduce our speakers, um, just two, two announcements. Um, the first of that is that um, uh, those of you who uh, want to access Wi-Fi, um, the ID and password that you need are now up on the, up on the screens. Um, the second announcement is that if you look over there, you'll see some, uh, you'll see some uh, posters. Uh, you can browse these when you like, um, but they will be the, they, they'll also, you'll also get a chance to, uh, I think, meet, um, meet their creators at uh, 6.15 in the undergraduate poster and multimedia competition. Okay, um, our provocateur today, this, this afternoon, is, uh, is Sheila Jasanoff, who is, of course needs no introduction. And the two discussants are Miles Jackson, who's a Dibner Family Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the Polytechnic Institute of, of New York University, um, who I think um, intends to set the record for number of, points, number of points and number of centuries covered in five minutes in his remarks. Um, and Brian Wynn, who is Professor of Science Studies and Associate Director of the ESRC Center for Economic and Social Aspects of Genomics at, at Lancaster University. So, Sheila, it's all yours. Thanks so much, John. Um, yeah, so, um, this, this event has been a while planning, and when I thought about how best to generate community-wide discussions at this meeting that's both retrospective and prospective, I was pretty sure it shouldn't be through conventional papers in which individual authors present their latest and greatest thoughts. I opted for shorter pieces representing points of view rather than findings, and on consultation I decided to call these things provocations. They were meant to be interesting and thought-provoking, to offer a synoptic or bird's-eye view of the field, and above all, to be short. Uh, it's been an uplifting experience to see with how much wit, grace, and originality, not to mention how generously each of my predecessors in the program has met the challenge. What makes the experience especially humbling is that I didn't realize quite how difficult the task was till I started writing my own piece and found it almost impossible. So let me offer my necessarily partial and personal contribution to the theoretical developments in our field. STS has been concerned with publics and the public sphere for as long as I can remember. I can't presume to list the highlights of that long history in 15 minutes, let alone offer a full inventory. So let me limit myself to just three key observations. My first observation is that we should be mindful of our own history at this point. With respect to publics, maybe unlike the case of difference that Steve Epstein laid out this morning on the basis of his unusual bit of scientometrics, um, STS has a rich history, published history, of reflecting on the public sphere, but we tend to neglect that history and thus not always acknowledge the field's own movements with all of its achievements and its limitations. When I ent entered Cornell's, uh, Cornell University's program on science, technology, and society in 1978, there was as yet no field of <coughs> STS, at least not in the sense that many in this audience recognize it. 
But there was little doubt what people thought was most interesting at the so-called interface of science, technology, and society. This was the problem of public participation. Today, the term that we hear more commonly is public engagement. On the surface, little has changed, only a word. Yet, in my view, there has been a profound generational shift in thought and inquiry, marked out not so much by the word that has changed, but by the one that has not. For the public of science and technology studies is not the same as the public of what in America was once called, and in some places still is called, science, technology, and society. Unless we analyze that shift and build that awareness into our scholarly practices, we constrain the possibilities for progress in the next 20. So what's changed? It's become fashionable these days for STS scholars to refer to the Dewey-Lipman debates of the 1920s in discussions of public engagement and to point out, correctly I think, that our sense of the public corresponds to the Deweyan ideal of an educable polity that forms around what STSs have taken to calling matters of concern. But a genealogical perspective reveals that in the practices of democracy, a more capacious term than public engagement, the 1920s debate never really went underground. Rather, its very endurance points to tensions in the theories and practices of democracy that should be central to STS. That brings me to my second point. If STS takes its theories seriously, then the starting points for theoretical thinking have to be diversified beyond the places where we tend to locate our own politics. For me personally, one such departure point has been the law, and I want to show briefly why starting there can make a difference. Many in STS know why July 1945 was a transformative moment for the US public sphere, but few could say why 1946 was equally so. Yet 1946 was the year that the US government acknowledged for the first time that technical decision making needs new forms of legitimation by going public. The Administrative Procedure Act of 1946 changed the presumptions underlying the increasingly prevalent rule by experts, the expert Raj, as the ironic South Asian naming convention might have it. Crucial here was the acknowledgement that unchecked power comes as much from presumptions of superior knowledge and reason as it does from an imbalance in status, wealth, or weapons. Bravely, a generation of US lawmaking set about to fix the imbalance in knowledge and in the stance of superior knowingness. The results were deeply consequential, indeed quasi-constitutional, according to some analysts. What strikes us now about the surge of legislation is the degree to which the public's epistemic competence was simply assumed, and I'm going to try to manipulate a computer, I don't know, but let's see where it gets us. Um, um, no. So um, the text of the Administrative Procedure Act, for example, exhorts agencies to inform, guide, make documents available to, and solicit comments from the public, beginning with the APA and carrying right on through such laws as the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act of 1986, the US Congress constantly acted on behalf of a Deweyan public, the intelligent, educable polity that Dewey advocated for when he took issue with Walter Lippmann's despairing characterization of the public as essentially a phantom incapable of informed self-governance and easily led astray by the distortions of the media. Oblivious to that philosophical debate, congressional enactments repeatedly affirmed the notion of what I have called a knowledge-able public with broadly defined epistemic rights, which you will see listed on that slide, comprising individuals capable of understanding, absorbing, and weighing information and holding their government to high standards of reason. More important, Americans actually behaved as the law contemplated. 
the growing vitality of non-governmental organizations and social movements around highly technical issues of health, environment, discrimination, or product safety, for example, offers ample evidence. It mattered, in other words, how the law imagined its publics. That's an American story grounded in perennial American debates about human competence and capability, and of course situated in typically American legal process. It would be profoundly instructive for STS scholars to trace in detail the comparable stories of other countries expanding the elsewheres, as Kashik Sundarajan eloquently urged upon us this morning. But that's not where I want to go in the time remaining. I want to come instead to my third and longest point. By starting from elsewhere, such as the law, and by following analytic paths that lead into, as well as out of, science and technology, we radically expand the descriptive as well as normative power of STS. To that end, I want first to emphasize the contributions our field has made to the scientific understanding of the public, let me say, and then to sketch the horizons that remain, in my view, insufficiently explored, horizons that would come into clearer view if we diversified our portfolio of places to start from. STS, as this audience well knows, has helped to dismantle any <coughs> presumption of a single, faceless, amorphous public, positing instead a series of shifting collectives that form and reform themselves around new scientific constructs such as the gene, new technological objects such as computers or the internet, new epistemes such as climate change or animal rights, and new socio-technical projects and imaginaries such as human enhancement, the doubly green revolution, or the eradication of infectious disease. This seems broadly consistent with the presumptions of the Administrative <coughs> Procedure Act, which also imagined shifting publics around changing issues. But our work also diverges in salient ways. The animating model for the APA was not the political agora, but its commercial counterpart, the marketplace. The participatory legislation of the post-war period adopted the conventional American ploy of leveling the playing field between experts and lay citizens through provisions for more open information, explanations, and reasons. Citizens were seen as stakeholders with preformed interests, needing only the resource of open information to actualize their democratic desires. STS research has helped thicken that understanding of lay publics as rational actors, needing only the public good of information to actuate their preferences. Maybe in Ted Porter's terminology, we should say that uh, uh, STS research shows the public as rebels against the information. Um, instead, we have shown that collective preferences are not formed in advance, but are tied up with identity and self-understanding which may morph along with innovations and concepts and things. We find no fixed stratifications between, say, the attentive and inattentive publics whose understanding of science was assiduously measured by survey researchers working for the US National Science Foundation. We encounter instead a vast array of potential publics ready to be engaged as well as to know and learn when new things catch at the fibers of their being. Curiously, for a field dedicated to exploring authoritative ontological claims, STS research has downplayed the importance of propositional statements in shaping public responses to science and technology. Where conventional accounts harp on public ignorance and illiteracy under the rubric of the deficit model, our work has demonstrated repeatedly and powerfully that public questioning of expert authority derives from unresolved questions of value and trust, questions that should not be decided without democratic engagement and deliberation. What looks on the surface like second guessing an expert safety evaluation or probability determination very often has roots in legitimate ethical and ontological uncertainty. People wonder not only whether a thing is safe, but also if the issues were framed right to start with, whether non-knowledge received as much attention as claimed knowledge, and who, against the backdrop of prior sad experience, will be responsible for failure or catastrophe. In the case of new and emerging technologies, is the thing worth doing at all, or only with different aims, or after more experimentation, or on a more modest scale, or under different supervision. 
And will these technologies deliver on their often overhyped promises? In short, as Brian Wynne has consistently argued, actual or apparent deficits in the public's calculative rationality can mask superior or at least different moral and political intelligence or intuition. In the contemporary public sphere, not all expertise is propositional expertise, nor is all knowledge held by the proponents of rational choice. To paraphrase Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in policymakers' philosophies. Understood in this light, STS scholarship helps to define a middle ground between two dominant views of the public that political theorists often render in oppositional terms, the liberal or economist view of the public as an aggregate of individuals bound together by well-articulated interests and preferences, and the communitarian view of publics united by adherence to superarching shared norms derived from religion, nationalism, or other powerful cultural codes. Missing from those debates is a serious engagement with the fact that today's publics are members of advanced, even post-industrial societies, their wants, needs, and possibilities ineluctably shaped by developments in science and technology. STS scholarship takes that missing background seriously, I would say uniquely seriously, recognizing that we share our world with modern concepts, things, and entities that shape our sense of self and other, individual and community, citizen, polity, and nation. As a result, the publics of STS are more grounded, actual, plugged in, and real than the abstract subjects of much political theorizing. So where, where are the problems? The very source of STS's unique strength, the focus on science and technology as shapers of human destinies, can, and I think sometimes does, narrow our political imagination. The publics of concern to STS tend to be those who constitute themselves in relation to issues and projects that are already demarcated as scientific or technological, and are studies focused by preference on controversies or forms of life around things that are emerging or in production. These techno-scientific moments are conceitedly important. Indeed, they're teachable moments. But by letting our curiosity run, run along tracks already laid by techno-science, we also lose things. We tend to box up our publics of concern as just another kind of knowledge producing agent. We emphasize how publics act as, and these are terms you will find in the literature, researchers in the wild, citizen scientists, lay experts, patient advocates, and the like. These characterizations run the same risk of reductionism that we find troublesome in scientists' views of the public. It makes STS's public sphere seem mainly a place for weighing alternative propositional claims, after all, instead of foregrounding richer conceptions of virtue, rights, power, or justice. It yields too thin a picture of politics. Wrongly, but perhaps understandably, following the sciences and technologies to get at the public sphere continually opens us to charges of exaggerating the wisdom of the multitude. When I shared the first draft of these remarks with one of my most perceptive colleagues, he took issue with what he saw as my glorification of the Dewey and public, and I quote him, so this is in an email just days ago, from Laertrill to global warming to creationism, there is enough evidence of publics taking rather problematic positions that we can't only be Deweyan about them. Somehow the trick has to be to make the space for public engagement, but not to assume that the public, or rather all the publics, will come to make good judgments, or at least judgments that we might want to concur in. This, therefore, is a criticism that comes from friends and foes, one that we should grapple with in refining our notions of the public sphere. To do this, I want to suggest that we have to broaden our concern with publics from what they know to how they function in the entrenched mechanics of power. If we do this, then we necessarily have to take on board not only how publics arrive at matters of concern, but how publics are constructed, by whom, and with what results for inclusion, deliberation, reason, and policy. At this moment, for example, Arguably, the most radical rethinking of the US public sphere in a century is coalescing through developments in three domains, neuroimaging of the brain, experiments in social psychology and behavioral economics, and a school of policy thinking attuned to correcting for human biases and heuristics through powerful nudges 
that help steer people toward making rational choices. No history of the human sciences or neuroeconomics will by itself reveal to us the complexity of this transformation, the means and mechanisms, or the ide ideologies that it enables. On this slide, you see the most famous exemplification of the nudge theory, a urinal in the Amsterdam airport, which in polite language, simplified the lives of Dutch sanitation workers. The key element in the image, which I hope you can see, is the painted fly in the bowl. When asked to explain the phenomenon induced by that painting, Richard Thaler, co-author of the nudge theory, is quoted saying, I'm sure there's an evolutionary explanation for this. If you give them, he meant men, a target, they will aim. <laughs> the evolutionary logic, as you see in this next slide, has proved very attractive to policymakers. I won't read the full text, but we'll leave it up there for a while for you to take in, both where it originates and what it says. Where in the work on public engagement of the deficit model do we find compelling accounts of the implications of nudge theory's particular construction of the human, let alone the constitutional implications of generalizing this way of thinking to all dealings between governments and their publics? What gets in the way of our thinking about publics that makes us insens insensitive to, even oblivious of, radical trends such as these? Getting into the public sphere through technoscience may desensitize us to the deeper normative presumptions that shape public reason and the structures of power and culture within which reason operates. For evidence and proof, logic and justification do not follow a single universal prescription. Indeed, as I've often argued, the differences between the West and the West may be as striking as those between the West and the rest. At the same time, the naturalized workings of the market may condition both global and local constructions of publics in ways that situated controversy studies cannot hope to unravel. Last, and mindful of the time, I want to reiterate a different kind of problem that confronts our field's political analyses, and maybe we can come back to this in discussion. David Winnikoff called attention this morning to this particular problem. Correctly concerned about reductionism, we don't always address the challenge of making our results demonstrably valuable to others. Our accounts enrich understanding, but they also unsettle certitude. The public's constructed by opinion surveys, focus groups, and deliberative polling, not to mention the minds revealed through trolley problems, brain imaging, mm -hmm. and neuroeconomics, seem much more tractable than the public's and modes of reasoning we detail through careful historical and social analysis. I hope we can come back to the question of demonstration. How can we establish the value of seeing potential publics in the ways that we do, complex in their thinking, open in their receptivity to new knowledge, and active in their own self-rule? So let me leave that question hanging. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to the comments and the following discussion. Uh, many thanks, Sheila, uh, for your invitation first to the conference, uh, also for your provocative talk today, and, and certainly for your work over the years, which has been very helpful to me as a historian of science. Um, I'm getting old, so I started in the history of science back in the, the late 80s uh, in a place, Cambridge, England, where SSK, or the Sociology of Scientific Knowledge, was informing the then newer versions of the history of science. And I felt then and certainly still feel now rather strongly that STS needs history just as the types of history which interest me the most need the, the techniques that STS has provided us. Now, while I certainly do not assume that the social, scientific, and technological structures and relationships of the past were as they are today, because I would lose my history card if I did, uh, I strongly believe that, the, that history begins to explain those current relationships and structures, and I look to the past in order to engage with the present, and, and, and that dialectic has always fascinated me. And I have learned much from STS. Indeed, colleagues, uh, both Sheila and Brian, and, and colleagues in the audience, uh, in helping me address that, that particular dialectic. Now, as a historian of science and sometimes technology, 
uh, I was asked to discuss how I think about the commons in the public sphere. Now, whereas Sheila spoke about the democratic politics of informed citizens, um, historians of science, I think, by and large, are in interested in the public sphere, define it more in terms of things such as print culture, peer review, communication, openness of shared knowledge. The classic article on this is, of course, the work by Tom Broman on the rise, of the, hist uh, rise of, of the public sphere in the history of medicine, 18th century Germany, German territories, the, the rise of a literate bourgeoisie. I personally am interested in the communicability of scientific knowledge, something I gleaned from SSK and STS scholars back in the day. In the public sphere, of course, privileged print culture, and the classic example of this is the Encyclopédie of Diderot and D'Alembert. Their goal was the dissemination of various forms of knowledge, and their hope was to codify the knowledge of the master craftsmen, as well as others, with a view to privatize and to abandon the mercantilist model, which of course was based on secrecy. Such a move, they argued, ultimate, would ultimately would benefit France and the general welfare of its citizens. So what were the key historical question was, who owned the knowledge? And the answer then was, the collective of the public sphere. And they did, after all, argue that artisanal knowledge had been ignored in the past by philosophers much to the peril of the state's economy. And that Enlightenment ideology played a critical role and resonated with British natural philosophers some 50 years later. So it's minute three, it must be the 19th century. Uh, John Herschel condemned artisans who wrapped their practices up in the garb of secrecy. And he contrasted the openness of scientific knowledge with the closed, inaccessible knowledge of artisans and their guild trade secrets. Charles Babbage rather infamously attempted to replace human calculators with this difference engine based on the rational principles of machines and mathematics. And David Brewster worked tirelessly to reform British patent law so that inventors could share their inventions and knowledge with others without fearing privacy, a uh, fearing privacy, which of course happened to him with his kaleidoscope, which he invented but didn't receive a pence from. And for Brewster, the patent was the noble choice when the guild secret was the other option. Of course, secrecy, as I've argued before, is critical to craftsmen as it ensured their livelihood. And skill, of course, was their prized possession. And this public sphere of sorts from below was very different from the one that Broman and others have discussed, uh, different in sociability and knowledge production and sharing. And I think this, uh, this tends to gesture at the point that Ben made and, and Sheila made earlier today that the notion of the public sphere is highly problematic, that there are different public spheres and variations thereof. In this particular example, it's a classic contrast between the artis illiberalis with the artis liberalis. And the views of, of these 19th century experimental natural philosophers influenced people like Sir Karl Popper. His open society and its enemies was a manifesto aimed squarely at Michel Polanyi's individualistic personal knowledge, which after all is our, uh, the origin of tacit knowledge. And of course, Robert Merton, some 20 years earlier, spoke of one of the ethoses of science being communism, knowledge sharing throughout the collective. To quote Merton, the communism of scientific ethos is incompatible with the definition of technology as private property in a capitalistic economy. Current writings on the frustration of science reflects this conflict. Patents produce exclusive rights of use and often non-use. The suppression of invention uh, denies the rationale of scientific production and diffusion. It was about the collective and the ownership of knowledge rather than the individual owning the knowledge. And I want to use this quote as a segue, briefly, as a theme that relates to my new work, and it's also a theme that's been alluded to several times uh, earlier today and yesterday, namely gene patenting. Certainly over the past 30 years, gene patenting has done much to vitiate the political notion of the public. One thinks of the works of Mildred Cho, Fiona Murray, who've shown that gene patents actually increase levels of secrecy uh, among scientists, which of course is the anathema to what patents are supposed to do. Um, Heller and Eisenberg have famously spoken about the tragedy of the anti commons resulting from gene patents. Because gene patents can, and at times actually do, have deleterious effects on downstream research. I think of, classically, we've all been thinking of the BRCA1 and 2 gene patents uh, for which I, and I know Shabit and others in the audience might have been asked to write depositions for the ACLU. Uh, scientists have testified, including John Sulston, who's the 2002 Nobel laureate, uh, in medicine stroke physiology, that, that certainly has thwarted research in, in the field. I work on the CCR5 gene, which is the co-receptor for HIV-1, and there has been that patent has actually blocked diagnostic tests on people who can 
used the medication known as Silzentri, which is the most expensive HIV drug apparently on the market at 12,000 a year. You have to have uh, M-tropism HIV rather than T-tropism. If you have to, you need to have a test. In order to have that test, you need to pay royalties to the owner of the gene, and it's been very difficult to have other tests than the one that Pfizer, off, Pfizer offers. Um, so there might be light at the end of the tunnel, which hopefully will not be the light of an oncoming train. Um, there has been a growing number of scientific and medical organizations which are promoting the openness of science and technology sharing, creating a public sphere of sorts. I think of the public library of science, part of the access of knowledge, open access movement. I'm thinking of science commons. Um, also open wetware, which uh, uh, shares laboratory experiments and protocols among various groups. So in conclusion, as a historian, I continually ask myself how questions about public sphere and openness and on the ownership of knowledge today relate to historical questions on these topics. The public sphere in the 8th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries about inclusion of various types of knowledge with a view to benefit all, even though the artisans is always tend to get forgotten, now, and this is rather interesting, those patenting genes wish to claim that this is nothing new. They argue that science and commercial interests were and still are rarely divorced from one another, and certainly innumerable studies in the history of science and technology in STS argue just that. We as historians in science and technology in STS surely do not want to argue for objectivity and disinterestedness among the members of the scientific enterprise. So what do we do? Do we simply describe it, i.e. the scientific enterprise? Uh, no. I wish to argue that certainly gene patenting is something not very different, not only in different in, in degree, but in kind, particularly in the relationship of the ownership of knowledge, and that gene patents reward the few at the cost of the, of the many. Um, and so it's just as much about denial of access than it is about the openness of access. And as scholars, we need to join forces, engage and intervene, as Sheila, I think, has so passionately and compellingly challenged us to do. And I hope that this is kind of a, a way in which we can begin to uh, enable such a program to take place. Thanks for your time. Okay. Brian. Thanks, John. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, thanks doubly to Sheila for not only organising this meeting, but for uh, her provocation. Um, uh, appropriately enough, Sheila begins with um, a historical perspective um, about the, uh, the coming around again of participation or engagement, um, public engagement in science as the new mantra um, being attempted to be practiced in many places. Um, it's also perhaps worth elaborating her historical account with the connection which actually caused my first meeting with Sheila in going to Cornell uh, at some point, I don't know when, but a long time ago I know that. Um, the link is Dorothy Nelkin. And um, I began life um, at last Miles has mentioned the uh, sociology of scientific knowledge I began uh, well my, began my post scientific life at Edinburgh learning the strong program as it was being developed by Barry Barnes and David Bluer and um, others there as well like Donald Mackenzie, Steve Shapin so um, I l was learning SSK at Edinburgh for a long time, including after I left Edinburgh. Um, and I was interested and inspired by Dorothy uh, to actually go public, as it were, with the Strong Program. Uh, SSK, as many of you will know, was basically uh, pursuing an interest in the construction of scientific knowledge in scientific arenas. And I was interested in asking the question, what happens if we actually take those resources and look at scientific knowledge in public arenas? And so that's what led me to, well, there were other reasons that led me to the Windscale Inquiry, uh, which led to my first book in this kind of domain. Um, so I went public with SSK in the sense of being interested in scientific knowledge in public arenas and using those uh, developing resources to do so. But I also went SSK with Dorothy Nelkin and her students 
controversy studies. So Dorothy was a political scientist into STS and a leading figure, of course, but she didn't really get into the kinds of issues about how was this expert knowledge, which is under con controversial uh, dynamics of one kind or another, how was this expert knowledge constructed beyond a political interest type of analysis? So uh, I didn't really know what I was getting into with this double move, um, but it's led to some interesting places down the years anyway. But I guess one characteristic that I learnt in Edinburgh was that um, I needed to be adopting an interpretive approach to controversy. In other words, ask that question and don't take for granted that, as someone put it earlier today, you know, don't let's assume that we actually know what the actors in these controversies are actually on about. Let's treat that as a, an analytical problem and an interpretive problem. And that's the way in which I approached this kind of attempt to bring SSK into uh, connection with Nelkin's uh, approach to controversy. So this leads me to um, a historical observation from about 10 years ago in this very city at this very university of Harvard, a meeting which Sheila organized on biotechnology and global governance where we had one of the uh, most senior scientists from the UK uh, involved in policy, uh, John Krebs, now Sir John Krebs, um, who I don't think he was then chief of the Food Standards Agency in the UK. He may have been. Anyway, the meeting in Harvard, we had just published the, um, the PABE report, looking at public attitudes to GMOs, basically, agricultural biotechnologies in Europe. And we'd done empirical, uh, qualitative and empirical work in five member states. And we'd submitted the report, published it. Um, and John Krebs had read at least some of it. Um, <clears throat> and over dinner with Sheila, Sheila may remember this, he actually said, very interesting report, Brian, uh, very interesting, some very subtle insights. But basically, the bottom line for me is, if they buy it, they like it. Well, there is an interesting approach to the very question which Sheila has raised and the issues which are concerned with how do we know what the public is actually on about, what its concerns are, what its meanings are, when we see them and hear them and sometimes even feel them in direct action protests of various kinds, how do we know what they're on about? And do we simply presume to know that and then begin to act from there? Or do we actually treat that as an important democratic question? Particularly in the context of issues which are intensely imbued with scientific questions and scientific claims and propositions of different kinds. So this, this was what led me um, to, uh, I, mean, I didn't know what to say to him really. I think maybe the next day I said something like um, that was basically behaviorism um, being sanctified in, in your definition of how we interpret public actions in these respects. And um, it, it's confirmed, I guess, my uh, determination to keep that question alive in the work that I do and the work that I do with others as well. Um, and Sheila's noted quite rightly that publics often have different concerns. It's not simply. Most of the controversies that I've either been involved in and also analysed as an observer of those controversies with science right there in the middle of the controversy, very rarely have the publics who've been involved as sceptics, opponents, resistors of those scientific uh, prescriptions of policies sold in the name of science, very rarely have those publics actually claimed to know better than the scientists about the science concern. Very rarely, if ever, in fact, has that been the case. And the, the point that publics have different concerns that need to be recognized as such and negotiated as such 
is very rarely recognized by those institutions who are actually handling the public sphere and the public policy commitments and debates, uh, and including the public engagement processes. Um, uh, I, I haven't got time now to relate my experience of last year in the UK, sitting on the steering group of the UK Food Standards Agency, the very same agency that John Krebs had by then um, retired from as director. Um, but in that particular issue, a public engagement dialogue was proposed by the Food Standards Agency uh, at the invitation of Number 10 Downing Street. And the insistent definition of the issue right through the whole of the discussion and debate and negotiation, uh, the insistent return was to the definition, this is a risk issue. In other words, this is a scientific issue. And any other concerns are not legitimate, they're not grounded, they're not real, and we are not listening. Well, when publics, as Sheila's indicated, when publics might actually be wanting to interject different concerns, to reflect genuine difference into that kind of policy arena, then by definition, if they differ, if they disagree, if they have different concerns, they're basically subject to the deficit model explanation. If the premise is this is only a risk and scientific issue, then any difference is bound to be a rejection or a misunderstanding of the science. It's preordained in the premise. And that's why I think we've seen, as I've noted in various publications, a, a continual recognition, sometimes by some, a recognition of the inadequacy and the mistaken character of the deficit model explanation of public opposition or public difference with the policies, as I say, sold and justified in the name of science, the, there's, there's been a continual return to new versions of the deficit model almost in the same breath as the acknowledgement that the deficit model is mistaken. And the deficit model not as a statement that the publics you know, know better than the science, of the scientists, but actually deficit model explanation of difference, that difference and disagreement from the public and opposition is caused by a deficit of their understanding. So the continual return to new versions of the deficit model is symptomatic of something deeper in the institutional cultures of policy that I've been interested to try to actually explore and identify. And in particular, I think the um, one of the strongest arenas where that has been the case has been the European Union. And in our report of three, four years ago now, um, taking European Knowledge Society seriously, where Sheila was a, a member of that working group, and Uli Felt and Pierre Benoit Joly uh, as participants here, were all <coughs> members of that working group which produced that report. We attempted to raise these kinds of issues with the Commission and they were essentially um, rejected, is probably putting it politely. I was actually um, informed by one senior advisor to the Commission that it was a questionable use of public money to have actually you know, supported the activity of that working group as an advisory working group to the European Commission. Um, so I want to just emphasize, and yes, uh, John's giving me the zero. Um, uh, so I'm now buying, apparently. I'm buying my time. I don't know whether it's drinks or, or dollars or what, but anyway. Um, the, the important thing is, uh, and I can't give you the examples, unfortunately, in this zero time I've got now, but the important thing is to see the way in which the very honourable and necessary original ambition of the founders of the, what's now the European Union of 27 member states, the coal and steel community of, I think, the five uh, in the mid-1950s under the inspiration of Jean Monnet, uh, was actually the explicit aim of that community was no more war in Europe, no more war between European neighbouring states, a perfectly honourable and necessary, given the 20th century history, an honourable and necessary aim. The problem is it's been translated by the European Commission in particular into a technocratic definition of political unity. 
And as I say, I don't have time to elaborate and describe <coughs> the details of that now. I'm just going to leave it hanging out there. And many of you will understand what I mean. And I can give you the examples if you choose to uh, ask for them. So the scientization, in other words, of the many arenas in which science is involved as not only informing public policy, but actually giving public policy its meaning, is a crucial shift, historical shift, in the role that scientific knowledge is playing in public policy arenas, like the European Union, but its member states too. It's not only a matter of informing public policy, but actually defining what the legitimate concerns are. In that sense, it's imposing identity on those publics and defining their concerns and refusing to listen to concerns which don't lie within that kind of institutional definition. Um, so I was listening to... Uh our three speakers, it, it, it occurred to me that uh, it would be possible to sort of throw in a, a distinction that is sometimes made in the, uh, certainly liter the literature on deliberative democracy between um, reflective and unreflective publics. Um, in a way, that's, um, that, that sort of just echoes the, the, the long-running uh, distinction that um, Sheila referred to, sort of going back to Lippmann versus, versus Dewey. Um, though, uh, I mean, clearly for Dewey, the, the public uh, was at least potentially reflective. Um, uh, for Lippmann, the public, well, the public hardly deserved the name. It was really sort of composed of unreflective um, individuals. Um, it seems that uh, uh, the kind of nudge policies that Sheila was talking about um, actually uh, work, work best with, with such unreflective individuals. Um, so the question is, could, could such policies cope with, uh, with, with more, truly, more truly reflective publics? Um, those kind of policies do seem increasingly popular in a number of, a number of countries. Um, the, the, the problem with reflective publics that, uh, that sometime, sometimes they do sort of uh, seem to generate themselves spontaneously. Um, we can sort of think of exemplary historical moments in the, in the, life, of, uh, in the life of the public sphere. Uh, but sometimes they don't. Um, and that perhaps explains the, uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the increasing interest over the years in, in some of the innovations that Sheila was talking about, um, such as deliberative polling, citizens' juries, and, and so forth. Um, although the, there's always the, the, you know, the, the, the danger that their critics um, raise that um, such things are, are really, in, in many ways, sort of quite artificial creations. Um, but they are, they are a kind of public, but they're a, they're a creative public. Um, anyway, um, let's uh, now move to questions. So who would like to start the questioning? Um, is that a hand there? Mark Miller from Arizona State University. Um, Quickly, in response, John, it seems obvious that the reflexive or reflective publics are likely to respond to nudge policies by uh, e expressing the view that they're being manipulated by the state. And, and while manipulation in the form of advertising is something that's <coughs> perhaps tolerable in the state of nature world that Javier now inhabits in, in the market and the business school, uh, coercing one's citizens even in the form of nudges is, is highly problematic in democratic society. So I suspect the reflective publics aren't going to like it one bit. Um, but my, my, my question was really for Brian, which is um, it seems to me that your portrayal of the return of the deficit model <coughs> still persists in formulating the fundamental challenge at hand as an epistemic one, in that it is the, the scientists and or the public managers' cognitive deficits vis-a-vis -vis understanding publics that's the fundamental issue. And I just want to put that up against Sheila's discussion of the, the, the Administrative Procedures Act in the United States. Um, because, uh, uh, and, and to give you an example, uh, we, we've got a major controversy that's been going on over a solar electric facility just across the border in California at Ivanpah, uh, in which 
there have been a series of epistemic debates in which a number of groups have challenged the scientific claims of the developers of that facility, uh, and this won't surprise any, anyone who follows American politics in the room, um, about whether this plant will impact the endangered species of a, uh, a desert tortoise that lives uh, in this land. Um, but of course, the reason that they have posed that challenge is not because they don't, per se, because they don't believe the science of biology that's being deployed by the company around desert tortoises, but because the administrative hearing constituted by California law is specifically understood to be an evidentiary hearing, and the only form in practice of contestation that's allowed in that space is an evidentiary contestation. So the fact that these people think that there are spiritual issues associated with historical native use of this particular plot of land, the fact that there are rural communities in this area that don't like the fact that Los Angeles utilities are building a solar power plant in their neighborhood to send electricity back to Los Angeles, that these political issues are not legitimate within this hearing means that they have no choice but to put the, the contest in epistemic terms. But it's not fundamentally an epistemic frame, uh, uh, a problem, it's a problem of the constitution of democratic practices in this realm. And I, and I just think that if, if we continually come back to thinking that the issue is related to the question of, uh, of, of, of cognitive deficit uh, or of epistemic deficits uh, and, that it's the, and that it's the views of the public's epistemic capacities that are fundamentally what the issue is, it doesn't capture the, 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 the deeper political organizational challenges that are uh, structuring the problem. <coughs> Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I did actually say, Clark, that, that what I was describing is continual return to the deficit model explanation or rationalization of public difference is symptomatic. And I actually think I'm describing, a, a, if you like, an institutional cultural condition, which can be further analyzed. Of course it can. Um, so I don't think it is actually a purely cognitive deficit on the part of those policy experts themselves who are continually using new versions of the deficit model. I think it's a cultural condition which is a bit different. And I think that you can go beyond that, for example, to ask, well, what role uh, does the modern state have under conditions of neoliberal global capitalism which effectively require it? to actually align itself with determined promotion of innovation indiscriminately, uh, as long as science doesn't come up with some evidence of some harm that can't be uh, avoided or controlled. And you know, your analysis of the institutional framing of what is allowed as evidence and argument and debate, what's the agenda, if you like, and what are the conditions under which evidence can be defined and, and exercised, just the same thing with the World Trade Organization. <clears throat> yeah. Jack Stilgo from the Royal Society. Um, I'm interested to hear if any of the panel have got anything to say about uh, Climate Gate, because it strikes me with the sort of the, the tone of the conversation over the last couple of days being one of not wanting to waste a good crisis. Um, <laughs> climate gate strikes me as an opportunity to have a, a more interesting conversation about science's relationship with its publics than perhaps we've had in the past because it strikes, because part of that discussion was about <coughs> competing knowledges and competing worldviews, but part of it was a reaction against a a, a tone of conversation that science typically adopts with its, with its publics. And I think it's bound up with this, 
you, you know the 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 open source and and the, and the sorts of things that, that that Miles was presenting, and I just wonder if if there are any reflections on whether there is that opportunity for a new sort of conversation that's about um, scientific processes and scientific governance rather than scientific knowledges. I guess. Well, um, Jeff, thanks for the question. Um, obviously, all of us who are involved in this broad area have been thinking about that. Um, the problem with the word opportunity is that it often presumes that there was no structure there before, uh, whereas that's really not true. I mean, precisely the kind of open sphere uh, language, the Metonian stuff, that it's a, it's a heavily structured playing field against which climate gate happens. Uh, so I have two responses. One is that if you look at nation by nation responses to climate gate, you will see broadly speaking a re-performance and re-enactment of national political culture. John actually commissioned an article fr from me for his climate handbook in which I showed how in Germany, Britain, and the US, uh, similar civic epistemologies went to work and resulted in Germany in virtually no public debate on climate gate, in Britain in a very public deconstruction and reconstruction of individual honesty, and in America a reaffirmation of the same dynamics of pluralist politicization of the terrain as before. So, so that's at least a demonstration that the opportunity is less of an opportunity than, than one might have thought. The more interesting question is, what does the scientific community make of this? And I do think that, as you well know, that, that high-level scientists were quite shaken by it. And in that sense, for them at that moment, it was a lesser thing than the 2008 economic crisis for economics and finance. But it was that kind of shake, shaking up moment. And it's been incredibly interesting to me to see how age-old habits of reassurance and self-justification come into play. So the immediate institutional response was the response lying to hand of getting something like an external peer review group, the Inter-Academy Inter Council in this case, to write a report. The focus from the start was on how to make the same mechanisms that science uses better, therefore not the dealings with the public. How do we keep better records? How do we have better data access, and data management? I mean, you know, all these sort of proceduralist answers, still keeping the debate completely boxed in within the scientific community. And of course, they've issued a report. Um, so I was approached by that Inter Academy Council. I got an email. Uh, Due to lack of time, you know, we can't hear from everybody we'd like to hear, but you are one of a select small group whose opinions we would like to hear nevertheless. So I wrote back that I thought the whole framing of the inquiry they were doing was so alien to the way in which I would pass the situation that I felt happier not responding <laughs> to a, a direct uh, uh, question like that. I mean, in fact, I could have responded, of course, sometimes I do, but there seemed to be no purchase in it. Um, so, I, you know, I think that, that uh, one would have to, you know, really question whether the premise of your question is right, that it was an opportunity at all, or what it would take. I mean, after all, the 2008 financial crisis was a much bigger and worse thing. To what extent did it shape the foundational assumptions of the system against which global capital operates. Mm -hmm. uh, you can read Paul Krugman, who believes that we lost that opportunity, but who believes that climate gate was nothing, just a flash in the pan, uh, and that basically it was just some odd behavior by you know, a few, well, a careless behavior by a few scientists. So from Krugman's point of view, 2008 clearly was a crisis. Climate gate was not. So you know, that's, that's one sort of. Um, indication of what, what uh, well-poised, very powerful opinion makers uh, make of the opportunity that, that, you know, in a way did exist, but in a way not. Miles or Brian, do you have anything to add? 
Off to you. Well, mine's a minor point, but it, what Sheila was saying reminded me of, and there are people far better, uh, at, at more knowledgeable of this to address this than, than I, but it strikes me similar to the, with the Human Genome Project and a lot of people who worked with the, you know, on committees for the ethical, legal, and social implications thereof. And, you know, a lot of people were, were in the beginning years saying, wow, we get three to five percent of the HGP and H, HGP budget. And speaking to a lot of people who played major roles in that, they said it's, we've been phenomenally ineffective at changing or, or entering a debate as much as we wanted to when talking about the conduct of scientific practice in various fields, such as the HapMap project. So, yeah, it's a similar kind of echo in that response. But there are people in this, field, in, in this room who can address this far better than I. And I think I probably want to respond, Jack, by just broadening the frame a bit and asking a different question, which would be, um, how is it that all of the huffing and puffing in scientific terms uh, about global climate and need to do something, the anthropogenic um, uh, underpinnings of it all uh, has been so in ineffective in mobilizing any kind of meaningful public response. And I don't just mean policy response, I mean public response uh, for a long time. Of course, there are many initiatives being taken, even in policy hostile climate or contexts like the US. But nevertheless, I think it's, you know, it remains striking, um, really curious. Just, you know, if, if one starts from the terms that, you know, scientific authority counts in terms of properly mobilizing policy actors and, you know, beyond the policy actors, publics beyond them, it's really interesting in a perverse kind of sense that the IPCC has had so little effect. Um, yes, sorry. No, just one, one thing. Um, that uh, The fact that the IPCC has had little effect keeps on being blamed on the public. And there's this uh, overarching story that the public has been sold a bill of goods by the distorting media, who in turn have uh, people like the Koch brothers behind them and so on. But actually, there's very little evidence that it's the public that's doing any of the opposing. I mean, yes, I suppose if millions were marching in every American city saying, you know, we want cap and trade, you know, conceivably something might happen. But when millions marched in London against the Iraq war, there was a president in this country who said it was a focus group. So, you know, so <laughs> in, in that sense, I'm not sure there's any evidence that it's the public that's getting in the way, and I find it actually quite interesting. If it had been the, a focus group, Tony Blair would have responded. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> um, OK. My name is Alastair Sponsel uh, from here at Harvard. And I enjoyed about this session a bit of historicizing of the field of science studies even back prior to the last 20 years. And I was intrigued by uh, the way Brian framed a kind of shift from a, a study of scientific inquiries in a scientific arena to a study of scientific inquiries in a public arena. And I was interested as well to, to hear Sheila sort of theorizing various publics from within STS. I was curious whether Sheila or others would be willing to take sort of a step back. Uh, it seems that the model of STS that's reflected in this, this entire event has been one in which studying science and the public sphere, uh, broadly speaking, could be understood as almost defining the whole realm of STS uh, in this view. So I was curious whether you'd be willing to speak if there are different boundaries, if you will, to the question in this session, which is science and the public sphere versus, uh, broadly speaking, the, the view of STS as it, as it stands now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I think um, I guess it's maybe important to start with, if you like, the conventional view of how scientific knowledge is supposed to feed into the public domain. You know, scientists do their thing in their private arenas amongst their peers, 
and they, you know, replicate and they criticize and they compete. And then out of that comes the truth, or as close to the truth as we think we can get. And then that's translated into not only policy, but of course into economic innovation, technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's the conventional view. And of course, STS has done a lot, as of some others, to uh, point out the inadequacies of that kind of model of the relations between scientific knowledge and the public domain. Um, so that, I mean, one of the interesting things I think about STS, about the same time as the period that I was describing my own and actually Sheila's entry into this field, um, was that um, other uh, laboratory studies, um, thinking of um, Steve Wolgar and Bruno Latour's laboratory life, looking at the private negotiations of scientists, you know, what does this instrumental inscription, what does it mean? for us as scientists dealing with this stuff. And one of the points that they made about that kind of uh, interaction in the private world of the scientific laboratory was that those negotiators of what's going to count as scientific knowledge actually were always concerned, endemically, inevitably always concerned about an audience beyond the immediate participants in the negotiation. And that actually was quite continuous with observations made by people like me in more directly public arenas where scientists were actually practicing as witnesses, as experts, as whatever authorities of some aspirant kind in public arenas, which is that scientists, even in laboratories, are always imagining an audience, not only, of course, their scientific peers who they have to persuade, how are we going to do that, or their scientific competitors, how are we going to put them down? But also of people like funders, patrons, mm. and you know, other significant others beyond the immediate laboratory context. So that was, an, if you like, an, it, laboratory studies SSK observation that was also informing the kind of work that I was doing in SSK more in public arenas directly. Yeah. I, uh, Sorry? Is there a role for the laboratory study? Um, yeah, well, actually, I think that that particular um, point could well bear further study uh, in itself. Because I don't think, I might be wrong about this, people might correct me, but I don't think from my own knowledge of the field that that particular aspect has been really picked up and developed and explored in other scientific contexts to connect it with that point about scientists when they're operating in more public authority mode as advisors to policymakers, et cetera, et cetera. I can, yeah, many thanks. Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, I can address that because my, like an electron, my ground states in 19th century German territory. So um, where I would look at kind of the dissipation of science in the public sphere is when you look at physics and music in say 19th century Germany, right? Because, and that also, it, it also makes the, the walls of laboratories rather mm -hmm. porous because it turns out laboratories for adiabatic phenomena are organ builder laboratories, right? So, and in which musicians such as Wilhelm Weber and Hermann von Helmholtz, sorry, physicists such as Wilhelm Weber and Hermann von Helmholtz are also also very good amateur musicians who had a lot of musical credibility and also had an amazing amount of power in establishing with musicians things like the standardization of pitch and beat at the time, right? So that this notion of a kind of a, a scientist outside of, of Kultura is actually not very not a very good way to think about yeah. the stuff I've worked on. So that that's exactly yeah. kind of the separate. This isn't science in the public sphere. That certainly in nineteen, it's certainly true today. But nineteenth century bourgeois culture, it's, it's uh, they're scientists who are interested in music, interested in aesthetic issues, and have relationships with artisans and musical instrument makers in order to create a polity as well as a science simultaneously. I would argue. And we so, need to think about Leviathan and the yeah, air pump, pump as well. Right? Um, I have three responses, not thinking for a change of Leviathan and the air pump. Um, so one is that, that um, in lab studies has become a basic method of STS, and saying is there room for lab studies still is like saying, you know, should sociology continue to use focus groups or whatever, I mean, you know. Um, 
so of course one should still continue to do lab studies in interesting areas of scientific and technological development because of all kinds of questions which however may change so for instance one might get more interested than the first generation of lab studies people did in questions of ethics and values in questions of how um, ontological determinations get bound up with other sorts of questions and concerns uh, which were just not present in the first generation of lab studies so as a method it evolves and it changes secondly um, there's a temptation, of course, once you have a method to apply it to various other things. And I think, uh, rewardingly, lab studies approaches have now been applied to things that are created in much more public domains. So for instance, the financial stuff that you heard about yesterday, if you were there, uh, or some of you did hear about, was essentially some of it, an attempt to use lab studies type methodologies to understand the coming into being of things in economic markets as if they were labs in which financial instruments are being tried out. And, and that's been very productive, though, as you saw from David Stark's critique of some of that, you know, there are assumptions and presumptions of the standard methodological sort that you get in any field from that kind of extension. However, I think lab studies become really problematic if we think that they should be <coughs> extended into the public domain only in those ways. That is only in the sense that we are interested in novel technological products, whether these be material products or scientific ideas or new social instruments. Um, I think much more interestingly, if you start looking at an awful lot of things that power does, as modes of experimentation, then suddenly the whole sort of limited but, but interesting literature of creating the lab in the field and you know, the sense in which we talk about the 50 states being 50 laboratories, you know, those, those kinds of things suddenly come into play. And I think that that much more expansive sense of lab in the sense that many things can be looked at as virtual experiments or as if experiments, and then using STS sensibilities and methods to go after them and probe them, that could be an extremely interesting extension of lab studies <clears throat> in the small. And it's the sort of thing that I have in mind when I say we have to not just be led along where science and technology are producing their latest and greatest inventions, so not just this year we're doing nano, so we'll all do nano, and next year we're doing synbio, and therefore we'll all do synbio, and the following year we're doing I don't know what, but you know, there are, there are much more interesting and expansive places in which to use that kind of thinking and those methods. Okay. Um. <coughs> Ulrike Feldton, University of Vienna. Um, I would like to take you a bit more into the European context, and I really enjoyed the kind of things that were opened up so far also in the debate. They're very close to my own concerns, and I would like to kind of pose the question of the European question on two levels at least. On the one you said already, there are many different technopolitical cultures, so very different ways of how the techno-scientific ties into the state making and in the, into the self-understandings of different entities in Europe that has been changing and growing in a, in a particular way. And then you have the, the issue of multi-level governance at the same time so that you have this idea of growing a Europe, whatever that is exactly, while leaving the nation states in some way intact. And there's even a movement, and Nelly today said talked about the Dutchness, but I think there is a movement of stronger uh, throwing oneself back into national understandings of certain things, not of others, but of certain things. And then here comes um, the, the point which I would like to, you to reflect a bit upon. I mean, the European Union in particular has drawn a lot in its discourse, maybe less in its practice, on STS language and research. There have been, along the history of building in particular, the science in society issues, there has been a long, and Sheila, you have been involved, and Brian also, in, in kind of counseling with uh, um, STS ideas and, and things like that. 
And I was wondering, what does that tell us about the kind of uh, implication of our field in policymaking when you see then that one of the outcomes might be something like a European uh, consensus conference on the meeting of minds where two, European, two citizens from each country f get flown into Brussels, they get 50 translators uh, to their back, they talk under apostrophes, quote unquote, to each other. And what is that as an idea of creating new civic spaces of expression, et cetera? Well, I actually have two uh, Europeanists slash Europeans sitting to my right, so I'll more defer to them, but, but uh, yes. <laughs> but just observing as an outsider, you know, it's an incredibly interesting moment if you take moment in the historical sense that it's not a second but a long drawn out period of emergence to see the European Union coming into being. And if you look at these United States, of course, you have a much longer history of this union, federal union, sort of coming into being and, you know, not knowing what to do with its budget in a chamber that also has two representatives from each state and I don't know how many guns at its back and so on and so forth. Anyway, I mean, the point is that, that federated systems are extremely interesting. This one is especially interesting because we're actually in a time scale where we can observe some of these things happening right now. So, nevertheless, there's a sort of overlay, which is that like the US, the European Union came out of a single market concept and is trying to become a political union in all kinds of very wrenching ways. So, the, I mean, I see the STS moves that I've seen, and Brian was extremely pessimistic about the impact of some of these efforts, like the report that we were all co-authors of. Uh, I mean, these STS efforts could be one of two or three different things. I mean, so one is that there's basically the power and the capacity to push through a rationalist agenda of the sort that we criticize in many of our writings and have that be the dominant bureaucratic way of running things with the science and society stuff only as fig leaves. A slightly more optimistic way of saying it would be that, yes, what they're after is fig leaves, but the fact is that they're growing things anyway, and even the experiments have unintended consequences. Uh, and a few weeks ago, we were sitting um, in Barcelona because I was on another of my European ventures, and Brian was across the table, and what we were observing was the European project as part of the research community as actually a place where a kind of identity formation was happening because you know, it, I mean, you throw money at something, you tell them, you tell people you work together and something happens, right? I mean, it's a non-neutral kind of action. And yet a, a last possibility spread out around this continuum is that Europeanization is not just an unintended consequence, but is actually a positive move of politicization because the spaces open up and in old fashioned language there are opportunity structures that are new and different and, and things happen. But you know, I'd be very astonished if it's either or for any of these possibilities. I think that what we can do as STS scholars and critics is nudge. That is the opportunity structures exist. Let's push them a little bit to go in the ways that we want. Let's elevate you know, what we consider to be the politically interesting and un, uh, you know, insufficiently articulated questions and problems. Let's figure out how we can use those structures in a way as we opportunistically did with our report. You know, Nobody told us that this report, we knew what the report should have looked like, we didn't write it that way. So you know, in that, that sense, I think that one can be a in however limited a fashion a reflexive social actor in spaces that are real, that have opened up in some way. Um, just as kind of as a token historian, so I took it me looks. Um, I think so I can speak fairly intelligently about Germany, certainly in the history of Germany, the role of 
science to the formation of bureaucratic entities is rather critical and vice versa. Lynn Neihardt's work, for example, Kameralwissenschaft, for example. So I think the role of the role of the Physikalsjutechnik Reichsanstalt in a governmental, uh, as govern scientists as governmental spokespersons with Helmholtz, the interesting question for me would be to turn the question around and saying how is that different now when you have an EU in the 20th century and post-45 Germany than it was, say, in 1870-1880, where they're actually very powerful governmental spokespersons in which they're, they're tinkering with notions of representation as well as various themes in, in science simultaneously. And that's how I look at that particular question. I'd cheat, but that's how I'd look at the question. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I ought to uh, confess that um, I do have more positive views of uh, some of the STS um, uh, outputs than I sometimes uh, appear to have. And so, I, as we said at the time, when we're doing that European report 2007, uh, let's make it a slow burner. Mm -hmm. And we're not only speaking to policymakers here in Europe, we're also speaking to publics, to civil society groups, to academics who might be interested in influencing things in Europe for the better. So we, yeah, let's see how it goes. Uh, I was re reporting one particular, uh, I think it was a deliberate threat actually, that was being uh, expressed towards me as chair of that working group. Um, um, but you know, that's, uh, that's the normal kind of currency I suppose. So, um, I mean, I, I, in response to your reference to the meeting of minds uh, uh, exercise, um, Uli, I think, I mean, it brings me to uh, think of, uh, of Dewey and, um, and what, you know, in, in his response to Lippmann, he effectively said, uh, Lippmann's critique of Dewey, really, he said, well, um, I'm not suggesting that publics are actually capable of understanding the complexities of modern society in all of its different dimensions, and that they can act in some kind of directly democratic sense, that they're capable of that. They've never been capable of that. That was the point he was making, rightly or wrongly, um, that basically they've always expected to delegate. And they've been, as it were, discriminating observers and monitors of the actions of those delegates to the political processes and decision making and commitment that was going on in their name. So uh, when we look at something like meeting of minds, I mean, I did actually study this partly for teaching purposes, but also in relation to some uh, paper I was writing at the time, and I was really struck by the um, role of the media in that particular exercise. Um, so that the, uh, the whole of the framing of the exercise was basically uh, that kind of patronizing, dismissive premise about the public, which is the poor old public it's confused and anxious because it can't keep up with the pace of scientific innovation these days. It's too fast, it's too hairy, and that's why they're frightened, and that's why we need to have these public engagement exercises. Nothing at all about some of the questions which actually those, those exercises raised, articulated by those same publics, which were actually about, let's make sure that actually there is public funding of research in this domain, and let's ensure that the private funding or the private research that is done is accountable to public authorities. Where did that go in the reporting of this exercise? Nowhere. Where did it go in the political response? Nowhere. So that the, the framing of the public becomes a justification for the neglect of demands which the same public actually made in that very same process. And that just is deleted from the whole exercise as a public exercise in engagement with science. So, uh, 
yeah, imaginations matter. Uh, they're not just, you know, imaginations as we think of that as some kind of dream world. They are highly material, as you know very well. And um, in that particular sense, I think that, you know, there is a lot that needs to be done in those kind of, in the development of civil society institutions of a European, if we want a European political union, we have to develop a European civil society which actually is able to provide those kinds of buttresses against the kind of processes that we've got at the moment, which is just basically an agent of global capital. Okay. Um, actually, I just uh, can't resist a comment on the, the final part of um, Ulrika's question, where she asked um, about, the, uh, about a consensus conference composed of um, two representatives from each country in, in the EU. Um, the reason I can't resist comment is I recently um, proposed something like that, only writ much larger in the form of a deliberative global citizens' assembly, which I wrote an article about. Um, I think uh, with, with, with things like the consensus conference or the citizens' assembly, uh, it's easy to point to their, their, their problems as, 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 as portrayals of the public, but then I think it's also important to ask, well, what's the alternative? If the alternative is either the European Parliament or the, Europe, or the UN General Assembly, then, um, then both of them look uh, re reasonably good. Uh, Logical framing of how we address these new questions. We cannot simply scale up the methods we have for studying, I don't know, a city or a county or something like that, and just say, now let's make it just a bit, a bit mm -hmm. bigger. And I think uh, uh, Nelly just said, for example, in the last session or before, I can't remember anymore, about intersectionality. And I was wondering the whole time what will be our ways of where we look and how we look if we want to study complexity of that kind. And I think in that way we are quite, I mean, that's what I said, what is taken from SDS? It's like a toolbox. So they take out these kind of deliberative models and kind of, and this is an engineering process of Europe. It's not just uh, a conference on something. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry, okay. I just had to. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say one thing. I, I think we need to sort of think long and hard how these things fit into institutional architecture rather than regarding them as like the key to effective public deliberation. Right. On, yeah. uh, uh, okay, I um, have several hands um, who have been waiting a long time. Uh, yeah, right there. Right. Actually, could, could we please keep on questions and answers brief because we're running out of time. We've got quite a number of people who, who have their sure. hands up. Hi, Janet Fertesi, Princeton University. Uh, keeping in mind both the next 20 and also the technology and science and technology studies, I wanted to ask a question of the panelists. In the last five to 10 years, we've seen a rapid incorporation of information and communication technologies into the public understanding of science domain, but also into science policy practices, ranging from you know wikis to public fora to uh, web platforms, et cetera. And with the movement of these technologies, there's also been a concomitant movement of the cybercultural ethos of sharing ground up openness alongside those technologies into these other domains that tended to be have, a, have an ethos that was more directed around privacy and gatekeeping and that kind of thing, uh, authority and power. So just thinking of a couple of examples off the top of my head, the move towards open governance, which has become increasingly important in small communities around the United States and in Europe. Um, the idea that, say, it's public, uh, publicly funded data and therefore it should be publicly available, culminating perhaps in WikiLeaks. Uh, in my own community, I've seen e-science initiatives that have really cultured or really fostered a, an entire culture of amateurs that are so now involved in the production of science that they're even being cited as authors on scientific papers. Um, and data release policies such as the National Science Foundation mandating that everyone's data that's public, that is funded by the NSF needs to be released to the public. And these kinds of ideas sit very uncomfortably alongside the kinds of, uh, the kinds of institutions that we're describing. So there, these modalities of interaction are building communities of lay experts who are increasingly entangled in the communities and practices of science and are also entangling policy actors with publics in different ways, or at least they're producing that kind of potential. So given this development and thinking, looking forward for the next 20, are you still seeing the same top-down deficit structural models and these structures being represented? Are the same categories and discourses being recreated and or structuring these technologies? Are the technologies still being used to restrict access to particular actors or who we think the experts are? 
or are you starting to see tensions or hybrid narratives of publics and expertise or policy practices appearing in your domains and in your locations? Just thinking of those of us who are around for the next 20 years, where should our attention be focused in this regard? Thanks. So if I could take a first crack at all of that, of course, the easiest crack would be to say that Trevor Pinch will address every single one of your questions in the next Can't panel, wait. which has to do with technology. But more seriously, there are a couple of reasons not to get, um, to be careful about how these questions are put in the first place, right? So, so to some extent, um, the data are just not in even to begin to formulate the questions intelligently. There's a great deal of stuff being said that follows very, very time-worn scripts like technological determinism. And forget America, we heard them loud and clear in connection with the North African events of the last couple of months. Uh, and one should be, at the very least, careful. Uh, so being careful means being aware of a few other historical precedents and cultural precedents. So to the extent that anybody's doing comparative work, which unfortunately Americans don't want to do, um, the, it, there is a question whether uh, the ways in which information technologies are being used go back to the sort of thing I was saying about the Administrative Procedure Act, that is whether it remains true that um, the American preference is to cons construct the agora as market rather than as political forum, and therefore to construct the new users of technology as essentially consumers as opposed to political agents. Uh, this can result in different models of openness and so on and so forth, and, and the little comparative stuff I've seen suggests that there are deeper underlying notions of citizenship that are playing out in the very notions of what openness and closedness are all about. That would argue for a sort of, you know, a shaded answer to the question that is always in people's minds. Does culture shape technological trajectories or do technological trajectories shape culture? And since we all are smart enough to know that it's not A or B, but it's how, you know, that, that will keep you occupied for 20 years at least, I can guarantee you, <laughs> if you take the question seriously. But, but equally, there's the question of, you know, so not, not just cultural preconditions, but, but other sorts of things about the, about the marketplace and, and so on, you know, which technologies come into being and, and so forth. I mean, you know, the, the wiki, I mean, I don't know, you know, let's, let's get a historically correct, believable, definitive account of WikiLeaks mm. first. Then let's ask a lot of questions. Uh, in response, I would be very surprised if the questions we're asking now are in the, or will be, or the answers to those questions will be the same in 20 years. I hope they're not, because if they are, I'm going to go bowling for the next 20 years. Um, then they for sure won't, they be, for the sure they won't be the same questions. Um, I think so. I'd be very surprised if it's a top-down um, uh, logistic. I would, the areas to look at, I mean, you talk about the NSF, also the NIH has the same requirement, right? That in, in there, that's why they're very upset with because gene Because there's patenting. a congressional law, well, or several. Right. I mean, that's so right. it's not NSF, and it's not right. NIH. It's a federal, it's a federal I mean, law, you know. right. Uh, but the pl sites to look at, digital media STS programs, right? I mean, I think this is where interesting questions about uh, open sourcing, and, and so places like the Steinhardt School at NYU with colleagues working on precisely these particular issues. How is it that these new forms of technology are challenging questions of intellectual property with lay experts? And, and you know, that's exactly, that's, I think that's probably the most important site to look at in the next five years. But I thought you were also going to tell us that the 19th century was full of lay experts. Depends if it's the German territories or not. No, <laughs> the UK and science. The UK and science. Hey, science is very right. Our artisanal, artisanal expert. I'm passing. Okay, that's okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brian, question for you. I was, I was wondering how you would situate the kind of imagination, the technocratic imagination of the public that you've posed today as the sort of unimaginatively imagined public of the technocracy in relation to other notions of the public that you have talked about elsewhere, for instance, in relation to 
nuclear politics in Britain. You've talked about the public as an externalization of the laboratory experimental site, where the technocratic imagination of the public is that which can be experimented upon as a political entity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering how the public as an unimaginatively imagined public and the public as an externalized site of experimentation articulate conceptually. Are they the products of the same places and times? Are they products of different kinds of, mm. of configurations? And in terms of the underlying structures that you said give rise to these kinds of things, are they the products of the same kinds of underlying structures? Mm. Um, I'm, I'm always struggling, Kashit, when, um, when uh, anyone asks me to think about what I've said somewhere in public previously, because I'm never quite sure what it was. I got very <laughs> but uh, I'm just trying to think. I, I think that the place where I described um, the nuclear experts uh, presuming to experiment on British publics, this was actually um, at the Sellafield site, um, in relation to releases to the Irish Sea marine environment, the sites on the coast, of course, and authorised discharges occur into the Irish Sea. And I think what you may be referring to is actually the... Um, it's like the material expression of the imagery of the superhuman uh, in heaven, nuclear expert self-representation. Um, and the translation of that, at the same time, into... Um, experimental practices which where the the site um, authorities deliberately set the discharges very high in order that they could actually see where the different isotopes went in the environment to chart the different environmental pathways and potential pathways back to human potential victims that was the point now I guess uh, what I was trying to say about that experiment was not that it was a deliberate experiment, a conscious experiment on humans, a society, publics, but that the public had no moral presence in their imagination. So it's a slightly, in, it's a more indirect uh, idea of an experiment on the public. It's an experiment on the environment, which of course had public consequences. There are fishermen, there were people actually in those days gathering porphyrous seaweed to make into a delicacy lava bread which is eaten in Wales and they were transporting the porphyra down to Wales to compose the lava bread. So there were a whole variety of pathways as a result of that deliberate uh, elevation of the discharges which were an experiment on humans in that sense. But I think that the experiment was done effectively unconsciously because it was indirect and the public just wasn't even imagined as anybody that you know had a standing what why would we think about the public so it, it just reminds me of the of the earlier discussion about the laboratory without walls or society as the new laboratory that there's a really key issue there which is that you know when we're actually conducting experiments in laboratories and I've done it um, we often don't know what questions our experiments are posing. And, of course, in the privacy of the laboratory, that's often not a big public scandal. But when that occurs in the public domain, in the, you know, in the laboratory, in the field, then it's a question which is worth posing. What is this experiment? And do the experts involved in this experiment know the question that they're actually posing in conducting it? And I think the wind scale example with the publics who were actually the experimental guinea pigs, in that case, the experimenters didn't even know the question that they were asking. Um, okay, I think we've just got time for one more question. Uh, I'm uh, Ted Porter from UCLA. I, I, I thought, Brian, you might know this. Is the classic... Uh, in the sight of the of the public of the deficit of public knowledge, in fact, that the public didn't trust the risk analyses of nuclear reactors. Um, 
No, I, I mean, what I would define as being like the, the deficit model uh, egg, presence, not, presence in there. But no, but it's, it, it's the expert reaction to the public disagreement, which is the point. Well, that's what, I, what I'm saying is that, that, yeah. that was, it was about the public, fit, refu that is a public you know, misestimation, misestimation of risk regarding nuclear reactors in particular? I think, I think that's probably yeah. one of the yeah. significant places where it started. I'm sure that characters like this one on my left could go and find it in 19th century <laughs> German as well. Yeah, yeah. But, so, there, so, but I, I just want to, you know, yeah. well, I mean, uh, so first, I mean, uh, to add, I mean, you know, the deficit, there are some reasons why, the, why that understanding of the way, you know, we, the public, or the public, whether we are it or not, uh, use uh, science that are uh, that are real issues. So it often is applied to um, you know, to cases like genetically modified foods or nuclear reactors. I say where, in fact, it is, we are talking about uh, about um, you know, economic interests defending um, uh, their interests mm. and not just abstract uh, public knowledge. But the, am I right? The other thing I wanted to ask: it seems like the um, so what are the objections to the a deficit uh, a model, and it seems like the uh, one of the most uh, uh, you know crucial ones is that um, that that deficit is not just what the public doesn't know, but is uh, uh, you know all the all this misinformation circulating in the public sphere, and even Walter Lippmann, if I you know Walter Lippmann, I, if, if I remember this correctly, got his as it were, or, or uh, gives the evidence for his skepticism based on you know new uh, new fields of psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, who um, you know? Yeah, he uh, to say, yeah. Who are then? Who who yeah. uh, who are then? Uh, you know, forming the basis for a kind of uh, you know uh, public misinformation we call advertising to manipulate mm -hmm. that evidence. As even actually, as Sheila's slide here also illustrates, Which is, what would they say? Well, that now that now the um, uh, the free market lends its hand and so on to this <coughs> misinformation, but the, um, it, it is not um, that the public just doesn't. That it's not like you know, it's not just that the public um, is ignorant. It is that because of these uh, you know, evolutionarily given uh, defects of our uh, brains, it is that in the public um, domain, all kinds of typically self-interested information are circulating. And yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I, I think I, we'd have to go from the general said, though, to the specific. I mean, in the cases that I've written about, for example, we're talking about publics responding to something like nuclear power being sold in the name of science, or GM crops being sold in the name of science, um, and responding usually on the grounds that they've got concerns which aren't being recognized in that definition of the issue as just a risk issue. And not even the benefit question has often been articulated as a question in the public domain because, of course, it's usually been assumed that if anybody has an innovation which they want to promote for regulatory attention, then by definition there's a benefit. In state promotion of things like nuclear power, it's been something which has just been assumed for all kinds of other reasons. But uh, the, the point is, I think, that the deficit model as an issue uh, as, as a rationalization, a way of, of difference with the public or from the public, that that is something which has been specific to given issues where those publics who are expressing opposition have got themselves informed in some way or another. Yeah, I mean, I, and that I, I returns to... to okay. I, yeah. you know, I, I need to stop and just accept it. It does seem like, that, um, you know, I mean, I agree with you, and yet in mm. the um, circulation of, uh, of, you know, of... Um, <coughs> You know, misinformation or a yeah. misunderstanding seems to me to be a real problem, even if we don't yeah. accept mm. the uh, deficit, as it were, this this old deficit mm. model as the mm. as the um, as the explanation of it. Um, I have a couple of things to say about that. So, Ted, I mean, f first of all, the, the I think the American story about the where does it originate? I mean, you know, part of it, part of it was these. Uh, 
social psychology studies that were not only about nuclear power, they were about rate the following 25 risks in order of significance. And it turned out the college students and the League of Women Voters thought that nuclear power was the worst. And the quote experts, unquote, thought it was one of the safest. But I believe that the experts were nuclear engineers. I mean, that is, you know, so, so I think that that's a part that's often not reported. Um, but it was, a, you know, the, I mean, one of the things that I think one has to take away from these is what was, what was the interpretive framework that was laid on this? So it, not, not the question, why are the statistics coming out of these bodies not trusted, right? Nobody asked that question. And nor did anybody ask the question whether the bias could be the other way around, that the excessive confidence was the thing that was somehow overrated. So, you know, I think that the uptake and circulation of those studies themselves is, is a sort of interesting and important point to keep in mind. But on your misinformation point, yes, yet yeah, one should worry about the misinformation circulating, but um, doesn't that just force us back to one of the points that I think the panel has been making, namely that we should spend much more time talking about the theories of delegation by which we create the trustworthy in institutions that are going to sort out the bad information from the good information for us and the domains in which we do repose trust and do not repose trust. I mean, the American answer to this, and this is why I would also add a particular caveat that I don't think the deficit model is the deficit model is the deficit model. In fact, I would argue that in America it has never been the deficit model, but a discourse of deficit that is also concurrently present with a discourse of ability. That's what I was trying to say, and that it's where these discourses are being played out that that's interesting. So I don't think it's the same deficit model everywhere. but. But in any case, it's, um, there are lots of domains of activity where people don't constantly harp on and on about the deficit model. I mean, so by and large, you know, there isn't much purchase in the healthcare community to saying that all patients are idiots. In fact, that's not what's presumed. It's presumed that there's a thing called doctors and that they get trained and educated in certain ways that will make them good. And if we regulate them right, ethical diagnosticians of whatever your problems are, and that you're entitled to some information from them and so on and so forth, people don't by and large say all patients are idiots. So why do they say all citizens are idiots? And only in certain contexts. Why in the climate change context? Partly because there, there's no institutional structures of delegation, as far as I can see, between us and the people who generate our climate knowledge. I mean, so I think that th that that's the sort of direction in which to push back, and that does sort of lead back to one small comment I wanted to make back to Kashik, which is that. The experimental stuff, it's not just the creation of the experiment. I mean, again, it's the one has to think of the discourses and the practices. And there's a lot of post hoc justification of particular things that were done because the experiment was successful. So the GM stuff in Britain is being sold because the experiment in America was successful. Who ag agreed to the experiment? I mean, you know, if it really is, I am going to feed you corn that's never been tested properly. And then after a while, I'm going to declare that 300,000 people who, I'm sorry, 300 million people who were exposed to corn and soybeans are now an experiment that demonstrate the safety. You know, sort of elementary standards about clinical trials in India were not met in America. And yet that discourse of experimentation is produced as justification. So I would shift it from the realism of the experiment also to the discourses of experimentation and lab studies and so on and so forth. Um, well, we're about out of time, um, so I guess we'll have to finish there. So thank you, Sheila, Miles, and Brian. Thank you.